Today's episode is brought to you by our sponsoring partner, the Campaign for Black Male Achievement. CBME has worked over the past decade to support black men and boys to provide them the right word or the right person at the right time on their journey towards realizing their full potential. I value CBME's efforts, their focus, and the investments that they have made to define this new field for black male achievement and to rewrite the narrative that we want for our country. If you've not yet done so, I urge you to visit tbpod.com slash partners today and learn more about CBME and consider joining their membership and investing in the future of our black men and boys. You're listening to the trailblazers.fm podcast, where we'll explore the stories of today's successful black professionals, entrepreneurs, and leaders. Join us to access the knowledge, resources, and tools of these accomplished professionals and come away with the know-how, confidence, and motivation you'll need to blaze your trail. And now here's your host, Stephen A. Hart. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Trailblazers.fm podcast. I'm so excited. I can barely speak. We're into the final episode of our 2019 Wealth Series. This is episode 158. And our keynote guest for today's episode, closing out this Wealth Series, is the amazing Dr. Dennis Kimbrough. Listen up, Dr. Kimbrough is simply a legend, right? Many of you guys might know him. He's the author of Think and Grow Rich, A Black Choice. Also authored several other titles that are absolutely worth their weight and their time consuming this content, right? When it comes to building wealth, this is one of the people who I've been really, really wanting to get to pour into each of us and been working on this episode for some time. It took patience and determination, been courting and working on Dr. Kimbrough to get on this episode for more than two years. But listen, it's so worth it. You don't want to miss a minute of this episode. Some terrific nuggets of wisdom, gems packed into this episode right here. Right. So before we dive in, I want to give a quick shout out to a good buddy of mine, Lance Clay Smile Smith, dear brother who I met some 10 plus years ago. We volunteered together in youth ministry over at Church of Redeemer. And Lance left me an amazing five-star rating and a review that I just wanted to share with you guys quickly. It reads, I love listening to this podcast during my morning workouts. Each episode is full of excellent insights and inspiration that helps me to build and maintain momentum as an entrepreneur. Stephen is amazing and I'm grateful for the awesome interviews he facilitates on this Trailblazers.fm podcast. Lance, I appreciate you, brother. And I'm wishing you much success. I know you just launched your podcast, your new podcast, The Clay Smile Show. Big ups to you. Listen up, Blazer Nation. I want to be doing more shout outs for other people in our community. So be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the Trailblazers.fm podcast over on Apple or on Google or wherever you listen to podcasts. And for those of you that listen at home or at work and you'd prefer the web experience versus a podcast directory. Come check us out over at tbpod.com. We just updated the site and it's just looking amazing right now, but it's got the ability for you to be able to now filter through some of the content based on episodes you might like and content you might want more of. So hop on over again to tbpod.com and check that out. That said, let's get set to receive today's mission fuel from our featured trailblazer, the one and only Dr. Dennis Kimbrough. Dr. Kimbrough, I am blessed to finally be having this conversation with you, my brother. Hey, you made it happen. I guess this connection goes back, what, three, four weeks when you called me and I was held hostage. I was shopping with my wife over the Thanksgiving break and I picked up my cell phone and it was Stephen Hart, man. So, <laughs> wow, you make yes. things happen. That's, that's one of the qualities of leadership. Leaders make things happen. Yes, yep. yes. So Dr. Kimbrough, we love to start all the conversations off on Trailblazers from a place of gratitude. And I'd love you to reflect for a moment and maybe share an unexpected blessing or opportunity that you're most grateful for in your life right now. Well, I'm grateful for the foundation. I'm grateful for truth becoming evident in every area of my life. I'm grateful for the 21 human values that are bestowed on humanity. And as we know, of those 21 values, 
love is the greatest and love is the only value that endures. Mm -hmm. So I'm just grateful to be in this world at this particular time and place. And I know what my charge is. Yeah. I've been charged, like all of us, to place our fingerprints on life and prove that we were here. Mm. So I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak and share my message through your platform and through your form. And grateful for uh, having Stephen Hart in my life. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I've asked uh, 150 people that question to share why they're grateful. And I've taken note that many of the people I've spoken with have a thoughtful disposition which generally, you know, lends to a grateful spirit. And all that I've read upon you, you know, tells me by your very nature that you're a grateful human being. And I was interested. I've learned so much about you preparing for this conversation, but I wasn't quite sure where you grew up. Well, here I am in Atlanta or in a suburb of Atlanta, but I grew up in New Jersey. I was born and raised in Jersey City, New Jersey, and raised in three small towns. When I was 17 years old, I went away to college, undergrad, University of Oklahoma, before going to grad school at Northwestern. And me and my lovely wife, I'm grateful for her, for all that she has done for me. She gave me three beautiful children that I'm extremely grateful for. And out of that came three grandchildren. Nice. But we got married our senior year in college, and we left. And I was the first black male in the Leadership and Professional Development Program of Texas Instruments in Richardson, Texas, which is a suburb of Dallas, Texas. Mm. And I left them, went back to grad school, got out of grad school, and I worked again in corporate. And again, I was the first black male in their LPD program at Smith, Klein & French Pharmaceuticals in Philadelphia. Wow. And my rotation called for me to go into sales and marketing in the Atlanta area. And when I got to Atlanta, that's when I left corporate America and started working on my first book. Wow. I love that. I appreciate you sharing this. From what I read, I was captivated by the fact that you were intrigued by the whole element of wealth, right? I saw that you did your PhD program on studying wealth and poverty, right? Exactly. And one of the best pieces of advice that I was ever rendered, ever given, came from one of my committee chairs who said to me, he said, Dennis, when you're writing your dissertation, don't write it in a field in which only three people in the Western world are going to read or mm -hmm. examine. View your dissertation as your first book. And so when I was granted the doctorate and I completed my dissertation, I turned to my wife and I said, well, I know my first book. And she says, what is it? And I said, well, I didn't want to study poverty among underdeveloped countries. I only want to study wealth. And I really want to study countries. I want to study individuals, men and women, African-American men and women. So, Stephen, I carved out a list. I pulled out a legal sheet of paper. Here we are in my study. And I wrote down about 50 names, mm. a high-flying, peak-performing, high-achieving African-Americans who were making it happen. Mm. And they didn't know me, and I certainly knew them. But you got to start someplace, and this is my someplace. And after I interviewed those 50, I wrote down another 50 and I went after them. And when I got well into the hundreds, I quit counting. And before I knew it, I had the shell of a book. And so Success Magazine caught wind of what I was doing because Stephen, at the time, there were no books. And as you know, there are still aren't that many books written by African-Americans about leadership and success. That's one genre mm -hmm. that we just don't seem to penetrate. I mean, we write books about history, books about sociology, 50 million books about relationships mm -hmm. and the like, but very few in terms of economic success and the like. And that's where I was trained. And so Success Magazine caught wind of what I was doing because I had so many articles and requests for interviews because I had such rich data. And they asked me to write a series of articles because they didn't have that much content with African-Americans in this field. Right. And I wrote several articles. And one of the articles made it to the desk of W. Clement Stone, mm -hmm. who at the time was the president of the Napoleon Hill Foundation. Yes. And he called me up after I arrived home from another interview with Earl Graves, the publisher of Black Enterprise Magazine. He uh, said, young man, we heard about you. When can you come to Chicago? I would like to meet you. How old and were you at this time, Dr. Kimbrough? I was 36. Wow. 
And when I finished the book, I was 41. I was 36 when I met W. Clement Stone, but I had already started at age 34, 33. So I was well on my way when I got that phone call with him. And when Thinking Grow Rich, a Black Choice was released, and I went on my tour, I was about 41, 42. But I was in my middle 30s, and I didn't have the slightest idea what he had in mind. But the next day, I returned the call. And the remarkable thing about it, I was dead broke at the time. And my wife, she just tossed it over my mind. If he offers you a job, you got to take it. And so <laughs> that was my ulterior motive and my secret agenda. Well, anyway, I go to the meeting and he has palatial offices outskirts of Chicago. And there he is sitting behind one of his mahogany tables, big butterfly, you know, polka dot bow tie, smoking one of his signature Havana cigars. Wow. And like I said, surrounded by lieutenants. And he says to me, he says, young man, we have a proposition for you. But before we get into that, you're not the first person to do what you're doing. And I said, what do you mean? So you're not the first individual to go around the country and interview with successful African-Americans. And I said, I'm not. And he said, no. And I said, who else is doing this? He says, well, I know who did it. And I said, who's that? And he said, Napoleon Hill. I said, you got to be kidding me. I didn't know that. And he says, this is the basis of our meeting. We have a proposition for you. We want you to finish, complete, and update a book. And I said, what book? And he reached across his credenza, pulled out the last 100 written pages of Napoleon Hill, wow. and dropped it in my lap. Now, here you are in my study. And hold on. Let me show you those 100 pages. Wow. There we are. So these are, oh my gosh. Can you see it there? Yeah, I can see it. So this is it right here. And from Napoleon Hill's typewriter, and I keep it right there. And there you go, Stephen. You want to interview me? Here you go, right there. Wow. And so he dropped this in my lap, 1986. And my first inclination was no. Really? Yeah, because I was writing my book. And my book at the time is What Makes the Great Great. Right. I've all these interviews and wealth. And if you've read What Makes the Great Great, it's just one chapter of the nine virtues of greatness. And so he said to me, he said, if you have any sense, you'll push your book aside and finish this. Now, I knew what he was doing later on. At the time, I didn't have the slightest idea. But when I got home and I flipped through those 100 pages, Napoleon Hill was attempting to write a black version of his all-time classic, Think and Grow Rich. He got 100 pages into the manuscript, and these are the 100 pages, but there were only three interviews in there, and none of them I could use. So, it, Was there a framework was, there? Was there anything there that you could build on, or was it just the fact that it was well, Napoleon Hill? Uh, he had chapter headings, and it was more of, when I read it, whatever he emphasized, I used as chapter headings, and then I took, I looked at all the interviews that I had, and I was being selfish at the time because, again, what makes the great great was my book. But my wife made me, she made me alter my thinking because, Stephen, when I got home from that meeting, because I asked W. Clement Stone for financial support, he said no. I asked him for a number of things, and he's the only thing that he gave me was a medallion. And he said to me, he says, young man, whoever I've given this medallion to, they've never failed to reach their goals and objectives. So two, three months later, I'm in my study and I'm just pounding away on what makes the great great. And my wife came to me and says, when are you going to get started on that other book? And I told her, I said, girl, I'm, I'm not feeling it, man. And she said, well, you need to tell them something. They're counting on you. You said you were going to do it. You need to call them up or something. I said, okay, 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 okay. So. I wrote 90 pages and put it in a FedEx envelope, sent it to Chicago. They received it. They read it. They threw it in the trash. I said, no problem. This time I wrote 125 pages. Overnight it, sent it to Chicago. W. Clement Stone, Mike Ritt, the executive director, Robert Anderson, who was editor of Success Magazine, read it, threw that in the trash. But before I could write another page, the executive director, Michael Rick, called me up and said, Dennis, do us a big favor. You're an excellent writer. We've got your work. You know, we're going to make this fit, but do us a big favor. And I said, sure, anything. What is it? They said, take your doctorate, take your PhD, put it on a shelf. You won't need it for this assignment. Mm. I said, what do you mean? 
said, we want you to write this book as if you're writing a letter to a friend. I said, okay. So that piece of advice changed my writing style overnight. And it made the book timeless and seamless. And it made me think of not only for contemporary readers, but for readers, all right, you get a copy of Thinking Grow Rich or Black Choice. The book is 27 years old. Yeah. About three weeks ago, I'm walking off campus and a young student taps me on the shoulder and he said, I've been looking for you. And he wasn't a business major, so I didn't, I didn't know anything about him. But he tapped me on the shoulder and says, oh, man, Dr. Kimbrough, wow, I got this book. Can you autograph it for me? And I just realized that, you know, you teach here, and blah, blah, blah. And I said, sure. So I autographed it for him. And he kept rambling and talking about the book. And he acted as if the book was just released. Uh-huh. And I said, son, that book is older than you. And, <laughs> but the contents and, of it is timeless. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, that was the positive effect that came out of all the hard work. And I was honored that I was selected. And you got millions of people out there that benefited from this. But what people need to know, Stephen, if Napoleon Hill would have lived one year long, thinking of a of black choice would have been out in 1971, not 1991. Wow. 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 He was 87 years old. He died of a stroke. and. That now you have you have so many different renditions of Napoleon Hill's books. Right. You have a Think and Grow Rich Latino choice. You have right. a Think and Grow Rich Women's Choice. But those weren't Hill's books. Mm-hmm. Those were, you know, various takes on his books. Right. Right. But this was the last book that he wrote. Mm. That's amazing. And you've gone on, right? Since then, no, you've gone on to interview thousands of wealthy African-Americans, right? And one of the books he authored, The Wealth Choice, offers so much advice and wisdom. You know, you yourself, I've heard you say that it's not a typical finance book. And I heard a quote of yours that says, it's not about cash, it's about courage. Talk to me about that for a second. Courage, courage to do what? Yeah, exactly. You know, people get it wrong and they say, well, I've had some folks pay me extraordinary compliments and I'm I'm honored. You know, I've had people say, this is the first business book or economics book that I've read that's got absolutely nothing to do with money. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I said, yeah, that's probably a good take on it because it's not about money and it's not about cash, you know, and it's about the individual that you can become. Mm -hmm. And it's about courage. You know, I've said it 50 million times at the counter of success, there are no bargains. You must pay the price and you must pay the price in advance and in full. Why? Because the average individual in our society gets four ideas a year, any one of which, if you have the guts, the courage, the fortitude to chase your dream, would make you financially independent. Mm. It's like if I took a glass of water into a chemistry class and I assayed it down to its finest components, I get two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. But if I took the Bible into a chemistry class and I wanted to assay it down to its finest components, yes, I know you got 66 chapters in there. Yes, I know it's written by 40 authors, but just give me the meat. Tell me what I need to know. Number one, Stephen, believe. And number two, be not afraid. That's all you need. Mm. That's all you need. Believe. Where do ideas come from? An idea comes from your creator knocking on your subconsciousness, you know, asking you, do you want more out of life? But what happens? We don't believe. We find 50 million reasons why. Well, I don't have the money. I don't have the education. I don't have the network. Uh, My next door neighbor got, you know, this same idea. He or she tried it and it blew up in their face. No, we're talking definitely you this particular time and place. Mm. Be inner directed versus outer directed. If you live the normal life, Stephen, and what is a normal life? What, 77, 76 years on earth? Do the calculus. That only equates to 30,000 days. That's all you get. You get 30,000 days on earth. Mm. Time is not running out, but your life is. And what is the entrepreneurial Mm. question? The entrepreneurial question is, what are you going to do with the rest of the life that you have left? Right. 
Yes. And I think we both share in Earl Nightingale's you know, view on success, right? Having a clear idea of a, a worthy goal, a worthy idea, oh, yeah. and, and having the frame of mind to aim at... And when I was writing this book, Earl, right? yeah, Earl Nightingale sent me a nice handwritten letter really on legal sheet of paper telling me to go on, complete wow. it. It's necessary. It's needed. But you're exactly right. That was his definition of success. Success is the progressive realization of a worthy goal mm-hmm. and ideal. Yes, yes. I absolutely have the world of, I mean, I admire everything Earl Nightingale. I've studied so much of his videos. Would love to have been in his generation and time to consume. Oh, yeah. And there's only one that you really need. Yeah. Go ahead and get the audio version of Lead the Field. Yes, yes. Lead the field. Some folks might say it's dated and this and that. No, lead the field. No, is right content on. is timeless. Yep. You can, for anyone listening right now or watching this video, you absolutely should jump on YouTube and download some of Earl Nightingale's content. Majority mm-hmm. of his audio is available for free. And it is wisdom that is priceless and timeless. But Dr. Kimbrough, you know, we're in this series. Let me take a step back. This wealth series, this is the second year that we're doing this. And for you, as well as for those listening that are unfamiliar with the foundation of this series, in September of 2016, Prosperity Now and another institution published a paper that highlighted the fact that right now, if the Black community continues on the path we're going, we will end up as a community, as a black community at zero wealth by the year 2053. And that hit me to the core. And you've, in a conversation prior to this, shared with me even more knowledge on the history of that. But I wanted us to talk and educate and arm our Blazer Nation, our community here with some practical wisdom. I wanted to talk with you about your seven laws of wealth and hopefully in doing so, not only inspire the community, but provide them some practical wisdom to move ahead and move away from what this prediction has in store for us. Well, you know, before we get into those seven laws, we've got to do our homework. We've got to set a foundation. Please. And we really got to understand what wealth is, what wealth and success. And so many people throw a dollar sign, you know, when we talk about wealth and we talk about success. But Stephen, there are 10 different forms of wealth. And success, on the other hand, is a six-pointed star, and only one of the points of the star deals with finances. Mm -hmm. So let's set a precursor right now, because if we just throw a dollar figure on it, then we think that prosperity, exactly, that when we think in terms of prosperity, a prosperity consciousness can occur in any area of our life. So if you look at success and wealth in terms of a six-pointed star, the first point of the star is peace of mind. And what is peace of mind, Stephen? It's the absence of all negative emotions, Mm. fear, anger, jealousy, hatred, guilt, greed. And you won't be successful and you won't be wealthy if you're burdened with all of these, you know, negative emotions in your life. Mm. And we see it all the time with people. Number two is health and energy. And what is health and energy? It is the absence of disease. And what is disease, Stephen? It's dis-ease. It's the lack of ease. All right, here I am in the suburbs of Atlanta, Georgia. I'm 10 miles from CDC, Center for Disease Control. Mm. And you can walk right through the front lobby of the Center of Disease Control, and they could tell you right now, Stephen, there are no less than 2,300 diseases, maladies, afflictions that you can come down with from bloodshot eyes to post-nasal drip, from ingrown toenails to cancer, to hearing loss, to bruise on your knee. And the remarkable aspect of that, Stephen, not one was created by your creator. Not one was given to us, was bestowed on us from our creator. So when the Bible talks about working out your own salvation, what in the world are they talking about? You've got to close the gap. You're always closing the gap between truth. Whenever your Lord and Savior, whenever Jesus walked in or rode into a village and he would heal the sick, he would heal the frustrated, he would heal the impoverished, 
He would heal those who were depressed. The last thing he would say to him, Stephen, is go and sin no more. Yes. Well, sin doesn't mean that, you know, while you weren't looking, I reached into your bag or I pulled your wallet out and I stole a dollar and I apologize that for it. No, it doesn't mean that. Sin means it's an error. You've got to repent. You've got to change your thinking. The greatest gift that we've ever been given is the ability to change our mind. And some people would rather die than change the mind. So why would he say change your mind? Because if you don't change your mind, the next time I come into this village, the next time I come into this hamlet, you're still going to be sick. You're still going to be depressed. You're still going to be impoverished. And you're still going to be frustrated. Stuck on the hamster wheel. That's all a part of disease and lack of ease. Mm. Number three, loving relationships. And when I say loving relationships, I don't mean between you and your significant other, you and your spouse, or you and your partner, me and my wife. I don't mean that. I mean love of self. Mm-hmm. And not in a narcissistic way. Mm-hmm. I'm not being narcissistic at all. No, but you, can't love, because, yeah. Yeah. you can't love nobody if you don't love yourself. Yeah. And I'm like anybody else, Stephen. I love approval. You know, I love it when people say, oh, Dr. Kimbrough, I read your book and it changed my life. Can you autograph your book for my auntie, man? She's a big fan. I'm like anybody else. I love that. Yeah. But I don't need that. And that's the big difference. I don't need it. I like it when they do it, but I don't need it. Because those people who need approval and don't receive it, yeah. well, they're immobilized. Mm-hmm. And you got a guy in Washington, D.C. in the White House right now when he doesn't receive approval, he doesn't know what to do. I mean, he is completely mm-hmm. and totally out of his element. Yeah. But it begins with loving relationships. Mm-hmm. And what do we know about love? Mm-hmm. Sometimes love says yes, and sometimes love says no. Mm-hmm. All right. I don't know if you're a parent or not, but I'm a yeah. parent. Yeah. I got three grown daughters. I got three grandchildren. And I love my grandchildren. I love my daughters, especially when they were small. And sometimes they walk around the house and they're about to stick their finger into an outlet, into a socket. And what do I yell at the top of my lungs? I yell, no, no, no. Yeah. Is that because I'm mean? Is that because I'm angry? But no, I That's love right. them. That's right. So, I mean, loving relationships is critical. Now, next to last comes financial freedom and financial independence. Mm. And this is the crux of the point of Star Stephen. It's different for different people. Mm -hmm. For somebody that folks who I interviewed, I remember when I interviewed Don King, and I remember when I interviewed Bob Johnson and BET, they told me that they had to be billionaires. Mm. I asked them, what is their level of financial freedom and financial independence? They looked me in the eye and said that they had to be a billionaire. Wow. But then, on the other hand, when I interviewed Walter Turnbull, founder of the Harlem Boys Choir, and I asked him, I said, Dr. Turnbull, what is wealth? Define wealth to you. He goes, wealth is hearing the voices of my boys. Oh, wow. You can't defeat an individual like that. Right. It's different for different people. For somebody, yeah. it might be an extra $400 a month. For others, it might be $400 million. But you cannot place a dollar figure upon their success. You can't. It comes back to Mr. Nightingale's definition, right? Exactly. It's whatever you make it, is whatever that yeah. goal is, that target is. Yeah. If you have to be money, you got to be willing to accept the amount. Yeah. I tell my students all the time you got a guy standing on a street corner with a cardboard sign saying that I will work for food. He's just as wealthy as a Bill Gates, he's just as wealthy as an Oprah Winfrey. Mm-hmm. And my students look at me like I'm crazy. It's not coming. Why in the world do you say that? I said, because anybody can wow the customer. Mm. Anybody can do more than what is expected, more than what is required. Anybody can go the extra mile. Anybody can implement the number one rule of marketing. And what's the number one rule of marketing? Make the eyeballs move. Do more today than what you've done yesterday. Yeah. And last but not least, stopping to smell all the roses along. Mm-hmm. Critical question, are you having fun? Yeah. That's success. And that is wealth. You know? I have, you know, people look at me in a couple of years, I'll be 70 years old. Wow. Health is big to me. Yeah. That's a form of wealth. Yeah. For 35 years of my life, I was a runner, an avid runner, marathons, half marathons, 10K. 10 years ago, I had my first knee replacement. Five years after that, I had my second knee replacement. 
But that doesn't stop me. Three days a week, I'm in the gym lifting weights. That's a big part of my life, man. So that's prosperity that I'm willing to accept. Yeah. When you look at the average black male, the average black male doesn't even make it past 56. So I am blessed and I never take it for granted. You're ready to beat the odds. You've got to be able to spend now. There are 10 different forms of wealth and we don't have time to go on that. But the number one form of wealth is not money. You can reach into your wallet and you can reach into your pocket and you can put out a dollar, $10, $20. Money's not the first form of wealth. Mm. The first form of wealth is knowledge. Yeah. Why? Because the pocketbook can't grow to the mind grows. But the last form of wealth, Stephen, number 10, is confidence and charisma. Mm -hmm. I look at all the folks who I interviewed who were rich in terms of confidence and charisma. You look at Obama. He was damn near dead broke when he was running for president. He didn't pay off his student loans. And he said right. into his yeah. sixth year in the Oval Office. Wow. So he couldn't even pay off his student loans. He and yeah. his wife. But look at him now. And how did he achieve the financial aspect of wealth? Mindset. <laughs> Mindset. And number 10, confidence. Yeah, and the confidence. And Absolutely. Absolutely. You look, you look at Michelle Obama right now. She's on a book tour. And she's using number 10 to get you to go sign her books. Confidence and charisma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If Michelle Obama was in Atlanta, Georgia right now, and here I am in the suburbs of Atlanta, you could feel her spirit. Yes. You could feel yeah. her spirit. Mm. They said when Jesus walked into a hamlet, into a village, he was, what, miles away, but they could feel his countenance. They could feel that, man, something's different. I mean, something going on here, I just feel different, man. What's happening? Yeah. That's confidence and yeah. charisma. And you've got to be able to use it. Absolutely. I'm thinking you have my mind going a mile a minute. You know, there's so much truth in what you said. You're sharing wisdom with me, Dr. K, that <laughs> I've experienced and not been able to articulate the way you have. And it, it brings confirmation to some of the things I've experienced recently. And I love it. But you talked about knowledge just a second ago. Let's come back to this because I do want to touch on your seven laws as well. I think people are not only going to be inspired by this, but take away, because there's a lot of practical wisdom, what I call mission fuel, that you're pouring out tonight. And the first law of wealth, you touched on this a second ago, is knowledge, right? Prosperity and wealth begins in the mind. Talk to me about that. Yeah, that was powerful. I tell folks all the time, like my students come to me, they're about to graduate in May, Dr. Kimber, I need a job and blah, blah, blah. I can't walk across the stage without getting a job offer. And I said, you already have a job. And they said, what is that? I said, continual growth and personal development. Mm -hmm. Continuous growth and yes. personal development. Not being superior, Stephen, but being better today than where you were yesterday. Mm -hmm. You know, what I found out about these individuals, yeah, I found seven laws of wealth. And hold on one second. Let me go get my book. I got to give you a paid political announcement. Sure. Blaze Nation, I hope you guys are enjoying this wisdom. Oh, my gosh. Stephen, my brother, I don't usually do this. Yes. But since we are going live. Now, why in the world would I do that? Not because I want a pat on the back. Not because I'm trying to, well, yeah, you want to increase sales and blah, blah, blah. But what you shared about the information in this book. So why is this? And then we'll get to your question. Yeah. Why is this critically important, what we're doing right now? All right, here you are. You're seated in my study. Back there, I got a flat screen TV. And mm -hmm. Stephen, I can go ahead and place the remote control and you can go ahead and channel surf all you want. You can turn on to the Bloomberg Network. You can turn on to the Financial News Network. You can turn on to MSNBC. You can turn on to any of those informative stations that you want. And you might see an old interview with Steve Jobs. You might see Bill Gates being interviewed. You might see an interview with Howard Schultz of Starbucks, Phil Knight of Nike Shoes. Reed Hoffman of LinkedIn. I don't know, you know, any of those wealth creators. But when's the last time you've seen some of your wealth creators interview? Not. When's the last time? Okay, you got seven black billionaires in the United States. Tell me the last time you saw, do you even know the seven? Yeah. When is the last time you've seen the seven interview? I have not. Hardly. Right. Like, obviously, Oprah. Yeah. But we're not getting knowledge from Michael Jordan. We're not getting knowledge from Robert Smith. We're not getting knowledge. We aren't. We're not yeah. getting their wisdom. 
Yeah, and that's the problem. We are the only group that doesn't place the wealth creators on a pedestal. Now, I'm not saying genuflect to them. I'm not saying bow down. I'm not saying, you know, hey, give them approval, blah, blah, blah. But you can certainly follow their example. You can certainly follow their example. Absolutely. And Dr. Kimbrough, even to add to that, I mean, that's the fuel, that's the mission fuel that had me start this podcast, right? I have two young ones. I have an eight-year-old and a four-year-old. And my daughter, just to share with you my backstory, you know, three, four years ago, I looked at this four or five-year-old girl and I'm looking at newsfeed. Everything on Facebook is negative. Everything on TV is negative when black people are brought up, right? I live in Maryland. I live in a very progressive neighborhood. There are affluent black couples crushing it. I walk into my daycare on a day-to-day basis. There are black CEOs and black leaders at the top of the military and people who are running successful businesses, picking up their kids, who I look at and I'm thinking, man, not only are they successful, they're passionate, they're loving their life, they're loving what they're doing, right? And I'm not seeing their story, Mm -hmm. right? So you're talking about not seeing the billionaires. I'm not even seeing the people who are everyday successful people who are doing things that my daughter, my son might likely take a liking to, right? Yep. And want to pursue as a career and no one is telling them that there's representation in those careers, in those fields, Mm -hmm. right? And that was really the fuel. That was a fuel for me starting this podcast and interviewing yesterday at the time of this recording. Yesterday, we published our 150th episode. And so I've now featured 150 amazing episodes of successful, accomplished Black professionals. And that's the fuel for me is to put out in the world what I hope you know, to see in my son and my daughter in, yeah. in 15 years from now. And the reason why I brought that up, because I'm a Johnny come lately. I mean, what I did in the wealth choice or thinking wrote with your black choice, man, you don't have to pat me on the back because this was done in 1897. Mm. See, your most prolific scholar, W.B. Du Bois, in 1897, when he was teaching at Atlanta University and he taught economics, he taught civics, he taught Greek. For three years, he was university chaplain at that school. Well, in the summer, he would get on a train and he would travel up and down the eastern seaboard and he would interview successful black business owners, Mm. trying to find the the attributes, the traits and the qualities to financial success. And in 1897, he wrote the book, The Negro in Business. And, you know, there were two profound statements that he had in that book that we still don't even adhere to today. He said, number one, he said, the man or woman who won't control his or her finances won't control anything else. Wow. And number two, yes. And Stephen, number two, he said, nothing positive will ever occur in a community that fails to circulate its dollars. Mm. Now, he wrote that in 1897. Why are we going through all this nonsense 1897. Today? Oh, my gosh. Wow. Yes, exactly. 1897. He wrote that book more than 115 years yeah. before the wealth choice. Yeah. And those two statements are in the first 30 pages of the book. Why are we reinventing the wheel? Why are we like Sisyphus rolling that big boulder up the mountain to come crashing down on us? There's got to be a better way. And that's what W.B. Du Bois was doing in 1897. The only problem, we never read the book. Took the book. If we bought the book, we took it and we placed it on a shelf. But now this is the reset button. And I'm not patting myself on the back. Man, this is a seven-year study on your wealth cravings. There are seven black billionaires. I interviewed three. You've got 35,000 black millionaires in the United States, which really is nothing. I mean, we're almost equal to Qatar. Qatar, you got 930,000 people who live in Qatar, and of the 930,000, 30,000 are millionaires. Well, we got 35,000 black millionaires in the United States, but we got 34 million African Americans. Right. Right. So we've got a lot of work to do. But over a seven year period, I know that I've rubbed shoulders and I surveyed or interviewed or you name it. More than a thousand black millionaires. I got the data. I asked them 118 questions. How they did what they did. What we need to go ahead and close this wealth gap. Mm. And what do we know about the wealth gap? 
at the rate that we are going right now, Stephen, it's going to take about 230 years to close yeah. that gap. Yeah. Now, I'm not pointing yeah, I'm the on. finger. I'm not blaming the victim because we know how wealth got started. Mm -hmm. Because I followed the money over the course of my academic career, I've learned a lot, a lot about black history. Mm -hmm. Stephen, for more than 250 years, the quickest way to wealth in this country was owning, buying, and trading your first slave. Repeat that. Owning, mm -hmm. buying, and trading your first slave was the quickest way to wealth in this country. Imagine... You and your lovely wife, you get married, and the day after you get married, you tell your lovely bride, sweetheart, you give me five years, we're going to start a savings plan. I'll tell you what, after church on Sunday, we're going to go riding around in the real nice neighborhoods in Maryland, and you give me five years, we're going to start a savings plan, we're going to buy our first house. That's the quickest way to wealth of what we think today. Well, for 250 years, the quickest way to wealth you got a young white couple, they're living in a shack, they're in the slave belt from Northern Virginia to Western Louisiana, they wait for the sun to go down, they lock the front door, they want to make sure that no one is looking, they pull out this mason jar, and in this mason jar they got pennies, nickels, dimes, and quarters, and they dump it on the kitchen table, and they go through this habit every night, counting the nickels, dimes, and quarters, and instead of buying the first house, what are they saying, Stephen? Sweetheart, if we keep saving at this rate, I can tell you in five years, we'll be able to purchase our first slave. Mm. In the slave belt from Northern Virginia, where you live, Northern Virginia area, all the way to Western Louisiana, you had more millionaires in the slave belt than anywhere in the world for 250 years. You had four sitting presidents who from the Oval Office bought, traded, and sold oh. the slaves. Oh. You had the author of the Star Spangled Banner was a slaveholder. You had a man by the name of U.S. Grant who led the federal troops to, you know, victory in the Civil War on slaves. You had a president in Abraham Lincoln whose father-in-law was a slave owner. Until you recognize that, man. So the bottom line, I know where it came from. So how did we get in this point? And I'll tell you how we got on this point. And Lincoln knew it. Lincoln said, we need a day of fasting, a national day of fasting, and a national day of atonement. Now, Stephen, what in the world does atonement mean? Yes, like I told you before about repent, atonement means to say I'm sorry. Remember I said I took that dollar out of your wallet? I'm sorry, Stephen. I'll never do it again. But atonement means, yes, I'm sorry for my act, but I will never do this act again. Mm. And because this country never atoned for slavery, they had another act followed by another act by another act. So slavery ends. So what did they come up with next? They came up with Jim Crow laws, the black codes. All right, after the black code ends, then they come up with separate and unequal. Okay, after separate and unequal, they come up with reconstruction. After reconstruction, they come up with, I mean, 50 million different from redlining to subprime loans to mass incarceration, just because they never atoned for slavery. And it keeps setting us back and setting us back. So I can give you all the data that you want. 27% of African-Americans spend more on a weekly basis than what they bring in. Yes. Close to 40% of African-Americans don't even have a savings plan. Almost 50%, Stephen, every other African-American doesn't even use a bank for their financial transactions. What? What is the number one bank of Black America? I'm not number one bank of Black America is Walmart. What is number two? The post office. You got more check cashing facilities in the state of Mississippi than you got McDonald's restaurants. You have more check cashing facilities in the state of Alabama than you got Starbucks. And that's what's setting it. We need a plan before we can do anything, a rollout plan, a national plan on financial literacy. Mm. And where to do it? We got to do it in our black churches. 
you got about 75,000 black churches in the United States and they collect those 75,000, collect anywhere between 10 and $12 million a week in tithes and offerings. 500 million to 600 million a year in tithes and offerings. So we need a rollout plan of financial literacy in conjunction to doing what we should have done in 1897 when Du Bois came out with his book, The Negro in Business. Wow. That is amazing statistics and wisdom that has me shook. You talk about, and we can continue down this path of the laws of wealth, just to kind of touch on that, you touch on the churches. I mean, recently I've been giving thought to this because I've heard about, you talk about how long the black dollar stays within our community, yep. but you know, statistics about the other communities, how long the dollar stays within the white community and Asian communities. I, oh, yeah. I, I heard this shared and it's startling when you look at... Well, number one, top of the list are East Indians. And what do we know about East Indians? Dry cleaning are the businesses. Yeah. The dry cleaning is the fastest. Well, dry cleaning has created more millionaires in this country than any other business. East Indians, predominantly in dry cleaning. Dunkin' Donuts, you know, food franchises. The average dollar stays in the East Indian community 45 days before leaving. Wow. I didn't know the that. The average dollar stays in the Asian community, Asian community, whether it's Japanese or Chinese. Is it 26? Korean, 24 days. 24 days. Leave. The average dollar stays in the Jewish community 19 days. Mm-hmm. In other words, three quarters of a month right. before leaving. But the average dollar stays in the black community six hours before leaving. Six hours. Yeah. Yep. What can we do to change that? Financial literacy, raise the volume, raise the noise level. It doesn't kill your soul to be a capitalist, Stephen. Now, I am honored. I mean, I go, people want me to sign the book. They want me to bring me in to speak. But, you know, there was a lot of pushback when Think and Grow Rich, a black choice was released in 1991. They called me a Republican. They called me a capitalist. They called my book, Capitalism Warmed Over. Who is this individual to go around the country talking about blacks and success? Doesn't he know it's hard out here? Blah, 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 and this, that, and everything. So, But now the tide has definitely turned, and it's a different story. But like I said, what is capitalism? You take the word capitalism, write it on a piece of paper, C-A-P-I-T-A-L-I-S-M. Take the Latin derivative of that word, Capitalism, kaput, C-A-P-U-T. What does it mean in Latin, Stephen? It means head. What's the one thing you must use in order to survive in a free and open society? You must use your head. The time for thinkers has come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We don't live in a society that is divided between rich versus poor, black versus white, liberal, conservative, Republican, Democrat, male versus female. No, but we do live in a society that is divided between dreamer versus non And that's a segue, right? The second law of wealth you share is decision. And I think, Dr. K, I think so many people are paralyzed and just stuck in indecision. They're stuck in being unable to, they're always, you know, I meet so many people that are like, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, and they never take action. Yeah. They never do anything. They just are, you know, this is the way it is. Yeah, and gotta, <laughs> uh, a little bit less talk and a little bit more do. Yeah. Yeah. But you got to decide early on that you're not going to be poor. I mean, your creator doesn't know anything about poverty. You know, uh, Adam, where have you been? I'm, uh, you know, I was afraid. Afraid of what? Well, I was ashamed. Ashamed of what? Well, Adam, who put that nonsense in your head? Who placed poverty in your head? You know, it all begins with an idea. I mean, again, going back to telling my students, man, when, Chad Hurley came up with YouTube. And Stephen, what in the world do you know about YouTube? Every year, Hollywood produces 500 movies, right? Well, YouTube does that every 22 minutes. I tell you what, I just left the eight-year-old upstairs on the floor. Yeah. I'm watching the trend. She doesn't watch TV. She can educate herself on YouTube. She's an artist and she loves to draw. She sat down just now before I came down to talk with you. She's on the floor, on the hardwood floor of our family room. And she's walking through a tutorial, teaching her how to draw a particular piece. That's what Chad Hurley, when Chad Hurley came up with YouTube, when Reed Hoffman came up with LinkedIn, 
when Jack Dorsey came up with Twitter, when Zuckerberg came up with Facebook, when Kevin Sinstrom came up with Instagram, when Evan Spiegel came up with Snapchat. They didn't come up with those social media. They came up with those social media programs to do one thing and one thing only to change the world. Yeah. They did not come up with those social media programs for us to gossip. Mm. For, you know, to, and what your daughter is doing, she gets it. She knows it because it's all about raising your level of vision. Mm. So, number one, prosperity begins in the mind, ends in the purse. Number two, decide that you're not going to be poor. Number three, believe in yourself with no more else will believe in yourself when no one else will gotta sell yourself no one else is going to no number four to thy own self be true in other words find your area of excellence pour your whole heart and soul into it there's only three questions you got to ask yourself in other words to find your area of excellence number one what do i love to do what do i have a passion for what can i throw my whole heart and soul into question number two what would i do for free if no one paid me a dime, if no one gave me a financial reward for my efforts, what would I do for free? Mm-hmm. Because when you're doing what you love to do and you do it for free, your work is your play. And if your work is your play, you'll never work a day in your life. Yes. And then last question, if you can't answer those two previous questions, go to somebody who you respect and admire and ask them, what do you see me as? Mm. What do you think I would be good at doing? Steven, when I was a junior and undergrad, my fraternity brothers called me professor. Why? Wow. Always had a book under my arm. I was always in the library. They, we didn't call it study hall back then. We called it lab. They said, where's Kimbrough, man? I haven't seen him for a while. Oh, you know where he is. He's in the lab. You know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Speakers on campus, always in the front row asking questions. Mm, wow. So that we talk about, that's the fourth law. Fifth law, serve. Oh, yes. How may I serve thee? Service is the price you pay for the space that you occupy. Mm. And anybody can serve. And what does an entrepreneur do, Stephen? An entrepreneur solves problems, serves yeah. people. You solve a small problem, make a little money. You solve a big problem, make a lot of money. People will make you rich. People will make you poor, depending on your level of service. Mm-hmm. So go serve. And anybody can serve. Q plus Q plus M-A. Tell us that formula. I love it. I love it. Bring it on. The quality of your service plus the quantity of your service plus the mental attitude in which it was rendered always equals compensation. Compensation. Mm. Always equals compensation. Go serve somebody. Take the focus off you. Place it on your fellow man. Place it on humanity. And then the last two, thou shalt own thy own business and make thy money grow. Maybe I think this is where, where we need to touch on. Dreams of yes. Income. yes, yes. And the quickest way to multiple yeah, streams of income is, is the same, yep. Yeah. I look at the corporate world and I don't know, is it a lack? I see more and more black, because the fastest growing segment of entrepreneurs right now are black women. Yep. But now, I've also... And be, seen, and be specific, Stephen, Nigerian women. Really? Yes. Nigerian woman. Wow. Thank you very much. Nigerian. So, but I've also read some stories and input that says in our community, there's also a high failure rate amongst black entrepreneurs, primarily because we don't have those that are successful pouring into those of us that are trying to rise up. Mm Kind of ties back into your knowledge piece a bit, right? We're lacking the wisdom. We're lacking the knowledge. Yep. What do you think we can do to help get the right foundation to build a business? Well, I mean, people don't care about you until they realize how much you care about them. And any type of relationship that you got to have, it's not about getting. It's about giving. And it's about, you know, you, and it goes back to what we said about service, man. Stephen, burn this in your subconscious. Any problem, any problem can be solved if enough people care. I know you read Malcolm Gladwell. Mm -hmm. Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book called Tipping Point. And he tells you within those 330 pages, Mm -hmm. you got a problem, find enough people who care. And I don't care whether the problem is cancer. I don't care whether the problem is unemployment. I don't care if the problem is lack of education. I don't care if the problem is if you're dead broke. The problem is you don't have enough people who care. Because when you get enough people who care, That's when you tip the favor. That's when you tip the needle. That's when you move the needle into your favor. Right. Well, my brother, 
Thank you very much. You got to run, man. That was a quick hour. <laughs> Dr. Kimbrough, I so appreciate this time with you. One last question. What's yeah. one action that our Blazer Nation should take this week that's going to help them to blaze their trail? Turn inward. Look at yourself. You are responsible for you. There's no secret to There's no method to the madness. Go back to what Booker T. Washington said years ago. The circumstances that surround a man's or woman's life are important. It is how that individual responds to those circumstances is the number one determining factor. Number one, he said, whether that individual will fail or succeed. So when it comes to wealth, when it comes to millionaireship, it's not who your parents were. It's not where you were born, what side of town, what side of the tracks. It's not your education. It's not your networking. It's not your contacts. You know, but it is a function of your belief and it is a function of your attitude and it is a function of all the tangible skills that you have right now. Dr. Kimbrough, real quick, hold up the wealth choice for us. <laughs> hold up the wealth choice. Listen, Blazer Nation, I want you to go out and buy this book and support Dr. Kimbrough. I'm going to post all of his links to his <laughs> website and social media channels. I want you to connect with him and let him know how much you appreciate this episode. Dr. Kimbrough, God bless you, my brother. Thank you so very much. God and bless you. you and you take care. Thanks for the opportunity. All right. Have a blessed one. You too. All right. Bye-bye. I'm Steve Nehart, and you've been listening to the Trailblazers.fm podcast. If you're not yet doing so, consider following Trailblazers.fm on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And feel free to connect with me over on LinkedIn. Whenever you're posting stories or social media posts about trailblazers.fm, be sure to use the hashtag TBPod and hashtag Mission Fuel. We'll be able to see you and I'll be able to show some love. And in case you're not aware, our show notes for all our episodes can be found on our website over at tbpod.com. Now, if today was your first time listening, I just want to say big ups, enough respect for checking us out. You've made this Jamaican guy really happy that you're here with us today. And I'd love your help with keeping this black excellence flowing each and every week. So if you haven't yet subscribed, hop on over to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Search trailblazers.fm and subscribe, rate, and review us there. Be sure to browse through some of our past episodes. There are more than 150 published episodes now. And a little something is out there for everyone to help keep the knowledge flowing. We grow when you, as part of our Blazer Nation community, shares and invites your friends and family to listen to an episode you think might impact them most. We believe that someone listening to these inspiring stories are going to be moved to make significant changes that have generational impact for many others, both now and well into the future. Don't miss next week's episode. New episodes are released each and every Monday morning at 5 a.m. Eastern. Blaze the Nation, go out today and find a way to rise above, go way beyond, and keep blazing your trail.